country music, how has that impacted your own music? <laughs> country music has not influenced my music at all, but it definitely has it opened my eyes because all I knew growing up was mainly R&B and rap. And when I saw my mom like, you know, loving some Keith Urban, I was like, yo, who the hell is Keith Urban? Yo, what up? This is Amine and this is the soundtrack of my life. If they were to make a movie about my life, it'll probably start with my parents who immigrated here from Ethiopia to Portland, Oregon. Being a first generation child in this country, definitely shaped my life and my values. I think it, it made me a better person and really appreciate being raised in like two different cultures, uh, being Ethiopian and Eritrean. The song that would be associated with my, my upbringing and uh, my parents would be Islands in the Stream by Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, RIP Kenny Rogers. Islands in the stream. That's definitely just like one of the illest and addictive hooks to me. The islands in the stream. That is what we are. That shit just like feels like a song that you play at your wedding. Like at every wedding, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, my mom just was the one who really got music in me. Nonstop would buy me like College Dropout, Tupac's albums, Beyonce's, Jay-Z's, like way too many albums that uh, usually a 12 year old wouldn't get, you know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, my mom was cool like that, I guess. My dad like tells me like, like stop rapping and make reggae music about peace and love. My mom was the only <laughs> black person I knew growing up who played Rascal Flatts, Kenny Rogers and stuff like that. So it opened my eyes being like, okay, cool. Then I could go and listen to a Hello Goodbye album. You know, it's not, it's not the end of the world if I try that out. <laughs> I'm very, 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 very proud to be from Portland. Being a black kid raised in like such a white state kind of made me appreciate my, my black culture like a lot more. I love my neighborhood like Woodlawn and I love just my upbringing in Northeast Portland. But I also, you know, went to a bunch of parties in high school or middle school and I got called the N word just cause you know, racial tension. And um, that's just a reoccurring theme for any black person in, in America. So, you know, it's sad to see the old stomping grounds that I grew up in um, with black businesses and stuff kind of be kicked out and move further and further. There's still black businesses around Northeast Portland, but it just makes me miss, you know, my childhood at times. I would choose Dizzle Dance by Mac Dre for this moment in my life. I have this nostalgia of like, Everybody with a stank face in a house party, really sweaty, and everybody's listening to Mac Dre and just trying to get off their like illest dance. And I just, I remember being like a 13 year old kid trying to dizzle and like, it was just funny. It was just really, really funny. It was like a dance song that wasn't corny at all. It was like the first coolest dance song I heard growing up, you know what I mean? Bay Area music kind of really influenced Portland sound as well. Like we had to take from a city that had a lot more African-Americans because Oregon didn't really have a too good of a history for black people, you know? I used to hoop and I used to do track and field, but I knew I wasn't always the best at those things. You know, I was kind of like real with myself about it. When I started rapping, I really didn't feel like none of my friends could touch me in it. Not in a rude way, but in a way where like I, I really felt confident in myself doing this and it, it kind of, um, you know, inspired me to want to do it even more. Benson High School was a polytechnic high school, so we had majors. Like, you could do wood shop, auto, or like electric or radio. And me and my friends, we was lazy as hell. We didn't care about no major in high school, so we we took radio because we knew we could in there, and we knew we could go on World Star every morning. Back when World Star was like heat, you know. Still is though, shout out to World Star. But uh, <laughs> after school, we just started taking like our favorite beats. We didn't know how to engineer. We would just like press record. And then right before my verse would end, like my friend would walk up to the mic. I used to do these 6 a.m. workouts in basketball, like crazy drills and stuff, like crazy training. And ice cream paint job was like, the remix by Lil Wayne was like, I'm all over this ice cream beat like sprinkles. Why thank you if you's a hater? It was like the song I replayed every morning before I went to school. Like I nonstop played it on my iPod. Wayne had this run of just like doing crazy remixes. 
and everyone just at that time was so hyped for them. So when he did Ice Cream Paint Job, he he like really like murdered it. Young Money, served in a big shot, Chevy too. Like when he started doing that, like I was just obsessed with Wayne. I still am, I love, like I'm a huge fan of Wayne. Uh, definitely in my top five. It taught me how to like, you know, you gotta entertain the people who listening as well. When I made Caroline at first, it was just like a regular song that I would make. I made like 30 songs in a span of a couple months in college. We just kind of picked it off the whim and we didn't really expect much. We were just hyped to get a song with 100,000 plays. You know, like that was enough for us. The surreal moment for me was when I first heard the song on the radio. It kind of just like changed my perspective as to like, oh, okay, damn, like I have to, like I have to really pursue this artist thing. Cause this is like a, this is real now. I didn't know it, it would work out this way. You know what I mean? Um, I try to just have like the lowest expectations so I never get disappointed. I'm definitely proud of where we are and how far we've gotten in my career. I would associate that moment for me with So Ghetto by Jay-Z just cause that song has this like crazy cockiness to it. Furthermore, Ma, we took guns to the Grammys, pop bottles on the White House lawn. Guess I'm just the same old Sean. That's kind of how I felt, <laughs> you know, at, at that moment, you know, like, I was like, oh, shit, like, I'm good. Other genres don't really kind of live the same lifestyle as a hip hop artist did growing up, you know what I mean? Um, I don't think me and like a country singer had the kind of the same background or me and like a blues singer, I don't know. It, it just, is, it's, it's always different. Um, so Ghetto by Jay-Z just embodies this sort of like arrogance, like a good arrogance though, not, not one that pisses people off, but one that really is deserving of, of that artist. So my dream one day is to meet with Hove and talk to him just about you know, just advice, you know, he's he's been in this game for years. So to meet Jay-Z would be would be really cool. That's like one of the few people I, I haven't really met yet. Flossing and, and showing off in hip hop is important. I think it's a beautiful thing. I actually don't look down upon it at all. It's, it's kind of what makes it fun. Like I love going on my timeline and seeing a rapper with his new chain smiling because I know he's, you know, that's success for him and that makes him happy. So I'm happy for you as well. After we dropped 1.5, I just wanted to like have a few days with my homies just in Costa Rica, just to like chill out and be somewhere we've never been. I was driving an ATV with a helmet on, but no shirt. And it was like through the jungle, mud everywhere, water, waterfalls. And it was beautiful. It was a great trip. Um, but I got too cocky at one point and I fell really hard. My dumbass decided to do this trick while my ATV was on like gravel. I tried to look back at the camera, and when I did that, my body turned the ATV. My head hit the ground really hard. Like, thank God I was wearing a helmet because I walked away with like only like burns and like scratches all over my back. It hurt to take a shower for like four days because like pus and shit was coming out of my back. It was like disgusting. I definitely regret it, but it was, it's a cool little battle scar, you know? It was, it's a cool little memory. That was God telling me to shut the shit up and drive this ATV, you know what I'm saying? So. I associate this moment with my own song, Compensating. I have no problem self-promoting right now. I just really feel like that part kind of embodies me up again. You know, it was, it was great. I feel like intros on my albums are always kind of um, updates, you know, for like my fans of where I'm at in my life or where I've been at or what I've been doing. Just cause in the process between, you know, making albums, I do believe that it's like really important for an artist to like kind of build this experience and bring that back into the music. Um, so yeah, I feel like my life is definitely brought into my lyrics a lot. During my career, when I was coming up, black people were still getting killed, not talked about. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a thing, you know what I mean? It's like, it's nothing new. They wanted a billboard in my city to promote a sold out show. And I didn't, like, I was like, that's kind of dumb. Like I, <laughs> the show sold out, like why, why would I promote that? You know what I mean? I was like, this is a great opportunity to put a, put a billboard in my city that, you know, mean, that would mean something much more than a billboard to me. I was definitely mad at, at like, Trayvon Martin killings, the Eric Garner, like a a everything that was happening in those years. And I was just tired of people thinking like there was no black people in Portland, you know, like we, we kind of 
are marginalized and ignored and not talked about. Um, even shows like Portlandia, you know, and that kind of always frustrated me. Um, so yeah, I was mad. So, so I put up a billboard that was very blatant in my city, in, the, in my very white city, that said, yes, there are black people in Portland because I'm not afraid of no racist, you know? <laughs> a good song to embody that moment for me was Mad by Solange. People try and pin a black person as super angry or violent whenever they just get mad. Our anger versus, you know, a white person's anger is much different or perceived differently. I do believe that Mad was a song that kind of like embodied that feeling in a beautiful way. She's singing so beautifully on a song that's talking about being mad, you know what I mean? So that's literally all the billboard was. It was just the truth. That year when I performed at Lala was just a big deal for me just because it was just like a really hype moment to drop your first album and then perform in front of the biggest crowd you've ever performed for. That day kind of felt crazy because we performed at Lala at a 2 p.m. like day slot. They expected, I think like maybe 3,000 people to show up to my set, but it was like filled with like 10,000 plus to bring that many people out during the day. And right after, that performance, that's the first time I met Malia Obama. So that was like, cool. Like it was just like weird. I was performing at Lala, like my biggest moment. And I look to the right and I see like Malia and her friends like dancing to my set. After that, like we did like a after show thing. That's when I looked on my Instagram and I saw like Beyonce had like posted her dancing to my song. I was like really, confused as to like why God was being this nice to me. That whole day was just crazy. And the first song that I came out to for that set at Lala was Yellow. I was down, yeah. now I'm better. Stunting with my dogs like my first name Cruella. At that point, people had only heard that song for like three days. I came out and as soon as that beat dropped, everybody was jumping and I'll never like forget that moment. It was, it was definitely fire, it was cool. The start of Yellow just kind of is perfect because a lot of people think the beat is about to drop on that first line that I say, and then it doesn't. <laughs> I was down, yeah. Now I'm better. Starting with my dogs like my first name, Cruella. I love the fake out of that song at a show because you see it in people's faces because they're ready to like, hit the beat and then they don't and it's it's funny as f when i did black jack as a song i only called it black jack to avoid uh the clearance because whenever you name a song like someone's name like jack black i had to get it cleared with him you know i didn't think that jack black jack black would approve this like random rap song so i was like okay let's just we didn't have time we were trying to put out 1.5 so we couldn't really clear that title so i was like all right let's just call it black jack and then school of rap that is beautiful let's do this lo and behold Jack Black likes the song and he does a whole like YouTube review of it. And we're like, what the hell? This is crazy. <laughs> he said my name super wrong. Amine, are you kidding me? Completely, okay. I'm okay with it. It's all good. Like I love, he's just, it was just such a genuine and sweet compliment. It felt really good just because the person I was kind of um, dedicating this music video to noticed it and, and loved it and was really hype about it and wanted to make a School of Rap like movie. And School of Rock was just such a, such a movie that all millennials kind of like, you know, it, it was their upbringing. It was like something we all watched and, and remember. And when I was like 23, um, I started smoking more and, or just in general. And I was just really high. And I was just like, man, Jack Black's such a nice guy. <laughs> and I was like, that should be a lyric in this song. Rocking and rolling like Jack Black. Schooling you like Jack Black. How could you not like Jack Black? There was like no deep meaning behind this song. It was just, I was high and I was like, man, I love Jack Black. And this whole thing happened. The song I would associate with this is obviously School of Rock by Jack Black in the actual movie. And if you want It's like the, the happy ending of this whole movie. So 
I remember that song a lot just because I was a kid, like 12 years old in the theater, watching like other kids like my age, you know, doing this. I actually don't know if I was 12 though. Like, I don't, I don't know what year that came out. <laughs> but yeah, I was young. Humor is always something that kind of, you know, is, it really shows somebody's true character. You know what I mean? If you could, if you could really bring it onto screen and show people how, how genuine you are, I guess. I don't know. I feel like that's what I get every time I see something from Jack Black. Me and Tenacious D gotta do a track together one day. That would be really cool. <laughs> I feel like what makes a good movie soundtrack is when whoever's picking the songs for the soundtrack isn't picking it based on hype or what's gonna make people go crazy or what's gonna make the soundtrack successful, but better yet, like what music really complements the characters like story or, or the movie itself. Legacy is like very important to me as an artist just because I feel like you want to make sure that you always grew as an artist in your music and your music videos and just things getting bigger and better. Um, and that's always uh, something that I, I truly believe in. Um, so the rest of my movie would have to be uh, amazing. It has to be, it, c it can't fall off. <laughs>